28-year-old out of the Dominican Republic, Frankie Motas. Kent Maeda's on the mound today for the Twins. And the Mets swung on. High five ball. High and deep again. To, you know, you finish. Uh oh, and the ball to the backstop. And the A's. And still nobody out. That gets away. Buxton will score. First pitch, a swing and a fly ball, left center field and deep. And now a blast to left center field. Buxton with a diving catch in center. As the 2021 season comes to a close, it's fun to look back and reminisce on the best moments from this past season. Of course, with the amount of games played throughout the entire season, it's impossible to remember all of these moments. Well, there was certainly a multitude of moments played in a game back in April between the Twins and Athletics. And after that game ended, I knew I had to talk about it at the end of the season. It's possible you remember this game or you've never seen it. Either way, it's a game where Worth watching more than once. Alright, let's head back to the beginning of the 2021 season. Let's start with the Twins. Prior to the season, the Twins were considered to be wildcard favorites as they weren't projected to be as good as the White Sox. However, the Twins entered this game with a 6-10 record, not exactly a promising start. However, players like Byron Buxton, Josh Donaldson, and Nelson Cruz had started off the season red hot. So, it was only a matter of time before the Twins figured it out, right? Then we have the Oakland Athletics, another team who was projected to be in the wildcard race. Well, heading into this game, the A's were 11-7 after beating the Twins in both doubleheader games the day prior. And while the A's had actually started off the season on a six-game losing streak, they were able to find their footing, resulting in a 10-game winning streak heading into this matchup. In other words, they were riding the wave, which quickly became a slogan among A's players and fans. So who were the starting pitchers. They were Kenta Maeda and Frankie Montas. Off the stats alone, it seemed to be a lopsided matchup, when in actuality, Montas's numbers were inflated due to a terrible first start to the season. Now let's look at the lineups. It's clear that while the Twins have three red-hot hitters, the A's have the more balanced lineup. Pause the video if you want to look over these lineups, because I want to head into the game. Alright, top of the first. Montas starts with a strikeout to Luis Arise, but Josh Donaldson, the former Oakland A, hit a home run to take the lead. After a Nelson Cruz pop-out, Byron Buxton smacked a ball to right field for a double, but Montas is able to hold Buxton at second base with a flyout. Now for the bottom of the first. Fun fact, this was Maeda's first ever start against the Athletics. Well, he's able to get the first three batters out with some help from Arise for the first out. Despite a double from Brent Rooker, the A's were able to get out of the top of the second unscathed. Well, the A's took this opportunity and ran with it as Matt Olson hit a home run to lead off the half inning. Remember how I said the A's were riding the wave? Well, that's exactly what the A's are doing after this home run. The score wasn't tied for long as after Mitch Moreland was hit by a pitch and Seth Brown hit a single, Elvis Andrews hit a first pitch RBI single to take the lead. But the A's were not done. With the bases loaded after a Mark Canna single, a wild pitch scored Seth Brown. The A's ended the inning with a two-run lead, though it didn't take long for the Twins to come back, as Josh Donaldson made the sinful decision of swinging 3-0 and cutting the lead down to 1. Then Nelson Cruz, who despite having a hot start to the season was 0-6 for 6 in the series, crushed a hanging slider and just like that, the Twins regained their lead. But don't forget, the A's have a big power hitter of their own. Not for a certain number. Center field, and that baby's gone! Not only was this ball crushed to center field, the dance moves were even better for Olsen's second home run. Well, we don't have to wait much longer to see these moves again because after a couple outs and a Sean Murphy single, Seth Brown pulled a ball to the right field corner for a two-run home run. Unfortunately, the dance moves are only seen for less than a second, so that kind of sucks. After giving up seven earned runs, Maeda's day was over. His stat line looked like this. Remember, this was the first time Maeda had ever faced the Oakland A's. A few weeks later, he faced them again, and it was a similar outcome. In fact, among all teams Maeda has faced in his MLB career, his stats against the A's are the worst, as the OPS is much higher against the A's than any other opponent. This pitching change definitely helped as the A's didn't score in the fourth. 
In fact, neither team scored in the fourth. Well, Nelson Cruz felt that was too long of a period without scoring, so he hit a home run in the top of the fifth to cut the lead down to two. After a single by Buxton, Montas was taken out of the game for J.B. Wendelkin. And after a single by Jorge Polanco, this happens. And that gets away and Buxton will score. All right, well, both teams have now thrown wild pitches that led to runners scoring, but I guess the A's wanted to one-up the Twins. A ground ball hit by Jake Cave went under the glove of Jed Lowry, an error that allowed the runner to score. The game is tied yet again. The A's weren't able to score in the bottom half of the inning, leading to Sergio Romo, yes, 38-year-old Sergio Romo, to come into the game. All right, Romo has been in the league for a long time. Which team has he performed the worst against? Oh, no. Who's dangerous? Out at first base, Arise is going to score. That is going to be Polanco. To left and a base hit. Donaldson comes in. Wear it out, Romo. And a line drive. Base hit to the left field. Just like that, the Twins once again have the lead. But knowing how the game has gone so far, this means it shouldn't take too long for the A's to add some runs of their own. This is the correct assumption. After a couple of hits, one which resulted from a ball being stuck in Josh Donaldson's glove, new pitcher Taylor Rogers gives up a two RBI double to Jed Lowry, who is a guy known to hit a lot of doubles. In fact, if you ask him why he hit so many doubles, he'll say this. Uh, because I, I hit a lot of barrels on the bat and I'm not strong enough to hit a bunch of homers here in Oakland. Before Lowry's very weird two year stint with the Mets where he only played in nine games, Lowry had the fifth most doubles among all MLB players between 2017 and 2018. If only the Mets allowed Lowry to have his knee surgery in 2019. Anyway, now the A's are down by one run. And look who's at the plate, Matt Olson. Here's Olson. now blast to left center field. Buxton with a diving catch in center. I really wish Byron Buxton didn't get injured as much as he does. This batted ball had an expected batting average of 660, but Buxton was able to lay out for the spectacular catch. Funny enough, this ball was hit with an exit velocity of 107.8 miles per hour, the exact same exit velocity of Olsen's second home run of the game. Baseball is weird sometimes. Okay, so the score is 10 to nine and we're heading into the seventh inning. Lots of baseball left to go. Top of the seventh, Yusmero Petit walks Brent Rooker. Okay, good start. Well, no, because after a pop out, Luis Arise grounds into a double play to end the inning. Okay, bottom of the seventh, Taylor Rogers gives up a single to Matt Chapman. Okay, good start. Well, no, because Steven Piscotti grounds into a double play right after, and Sean Murphy grounds out to end the inning. I'm getting some flashbacks to the Mariners' White Sox game. Petit stays in the game for the eighth inning, and despite two singles, he's able to get out without allowing a run. In the bottom of the eighth, Rogers strikes out the side, because, you know, it's a bit more efficient that way. Giving up two singles only to not allow a run is a bit rude to the fans in attendance. Oh yeah, you may have noticed the cardboard cutouts behind home plate. I've actually been looking at this one the entire time because it stands out from the rest. If you happen to know who that is, please let me know. And if you want to know how many actual people were at this game, there were just over 3,400. Man, such a small amount of people for such a great game. And the best is yet to come. Where were we? Oh yeah, heading into the ninth inning. Despite a double, the A's got out of the inning only down by one run. Alex Colome has quite the task ahead of him as he's facing the heart of the A's order, and the A's are trying to extend their winning streak into 11 straight. Colome ends up hitting Loriano in the chest, and after a Jed Lowry lineout, Matt Olson hits a single to put runners at the corners. This was Olsen's hardest hit ball of the game at 110.7 miles per hour. And of course, it had an expected batting average of 660. If only Buxton could play second base, it would have prevented this from happening. Winning streak is on the line. High in the air now, the right field line. Rooker going back in the corner, fair or foul, and it's foul. Just like that, the game almost ended. Like, who cares that he hit a sacrifice fly afterwards? I wanted to see a walk-off home run. 
Well, the A's have tied the game in a bit of an anticlimactic way. Also, the inning ended in an anticlimactic way as Matt Olson was caught stealing. Time for bonus baseball with everyone's favorite rule, the runner on second base. Seriously, if you want to keep this rule, just put the runner at first base because it at least gives the pitcher a chance to induce a double play. For some reason, Mitch Garver pinch hits from Nelson Cruz and he strikes out. This actually wasn't the only questionable move the Twins made in this half inning, but that'll come up later. At least for now, the moves worked out. First pitch, a swing and a fly ball, left center field and deep. Back it goes, deep it goes and gone! The beat finally gets the drop as Buxton crushes a home run to left field. This was the hardest hit ball of the game with an exit velocity of 111 miles per hour. The score is now 12 to 10. The Twins decide to keep Colome in the game. Although a two run cushion should be enough, especially since he's facing the bottom half of the order, but he has given up five earned runs in his last three and a third innings of work, which includes the ninth inning of this same game. But don't think about that. Let's trust Colome. See, he got Steven Piscotti to fly out. Then he struck out Sean Murphy. Everything's going to be fine. Just one out to go. Okay, he walked Seth Brown and now the winning run is heading to the plate. But at least there's another force out in place. Okay, a walk to the number nine hitter to load the bases is a bit concerning. 40th pitch of Colome's outing. Should we take him out? Nah, it's fine. Keep him in the game. It's only Mark Canna at the plate. See, a game ending ground out. Okay, Blankenhorn, what are you doing? Travis Blankenhorn, who came into the game for Josh Donaldson at the top of the 10th as the base runner at second base, has kept the game from ending, ironically, at second base. Okay, now should we take out Colome? Nah, it's still a one run lead. What could Loriano possibly do? Okay, Colome, don't hit Loriano in the head. That's not what we're here for. All right, a foul ball. There we go. And another foul ball. Cool, strike two. Okay, decent pitch that was fouled off. I like the change in speed, keeps Loriano on his toes. All right, he's still making contact, so at some point, one of these pitches has to go and play. Arise has it, not an easy play, his throw, and the A's are gonna win! You gotta be kidding me. Kim scores! Well, that's certainly a way to lose a baseball game. Luis Arise, who started the game at second base, threw the ball way off target, and just like that, this game is over, and the A's continue to ride the wave. Not only did the substitution of Josh Donaldson in the top of the 10th not matter as Buxton hit a home run, it led to Blankenhorn making the error at second base and Arise, who started the game at second base, to make the error to end the game. So out of the four runs that Colome allowed, only one was an earned run. Why was Colome left in the game for so long? Well, these two teams did play a doubleheader the day prior, and out of the four relievers the Twins used in those games, only one played in this game. Still, this doesn't take away from Colome's awful numbers on the stat sheet. In fact, Colome's WPA, a stat that quantifies the percentage change in a team's chances of winning from one event to the next, was negative 1.102. Look at the WPAs of every other pitcher in this game and then look at Colomay's. That's a huge difference. In fact, throughout MLB history, only 22 pitchers, including Colomay, have had a game with a WPA worse than negative 1.1. However, Colomay is one of only three pitchers to accomplish this in the 21st century, and he's the first pitcher since Babe Adams in 1922 to allow one or less earned runs and finish with this low of a WPA. So, so in short, WPA basically says Colome is the sole reason the Twins lost this game, which is shown in the huge drop in win probability in the 10th inning. Is this a fair assessment? I mean, of the four runs he gave up, only one was earned, as the other three were the result of a substitution that didn't need to happen. Either way, what I can take away from this game is that while it didn't matter in the grand scheme of things, it's still one of the best games of 2021 and a game I hope we continue to talk about for the foreseeable future. I hope you guys enjoyed the video, leave a like if you did, and subscribe for more content just like this. Thanks for watching.